Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by my family on it. Supplements, weights, fucking elk, uh, whatever you need. Listen, you want to get in shape, you want to get your mind right, go to onit.com right now. Take a look at the alpha brain. If you don't like it, if it don't help you out after two, three weeks, you can return it. We don't even want the fucking product. We'll send you a check. Who does that in this business? Who does that in this industry? On it, because they believe in what they sell. Go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. Bam! And get 10% off. Delivered right to the fucking casa. You understand me? You can't beat that. You don't have to leave the house and go to some fucking health food store. <laughs> right at your fucking house. Got a park. Some guy in front of you has got a fucking twitch. You don't need that shit. <laughs> Number two, you, you're going to jiu-jitsu. You want to get, you're going to Muay Thai. To get a, get, listen, get yourself some fucking Fujisports.com right there. The shin guards, the boxing gloves, the fucking geese are tougher than death. You understand me? They're bulletproof. Nobody even tells you that shit. I'm a fat fuck. People pull me in their guard. They're hanging on me. My collar. I got fingerprints. And nothing. The gi still comes home and it's beautiful and it's washed. Intact. Why? Tough. These Japanese people don't fuck around when it comes to the gi. You understand me? <laughs> anyway, go to Fujisports.com right now and press in. Church. And get 10% off delivered to your house and you're helping out the church. Kick this fucking meal, Lee. Are you fucking nuts or what? And you thought the hell. Ah, you, you're like, hey, Jamie's got a gun. Fuck Jamie's got a gun. <laughs> This was when they were doing heavy-duty Chinese heroin. People were jumping off fucking buildings. You understand me? It's Wednesday, the 15th. I got beautiful Jimmy Florentine in studio. Jersey's best. God damn, did that sound good. Did it not? Holy shit. Why does it sound good after 40 years? Why? It's not supposed to. I'm supposed to listen to that and go, really, Joey? That again? Some of the stuff stood the test of time. The mu- Some of it sounds a little dated. I got to be, I, I, I say this a lot. And people will freak out. Some of the Beatles stuff, to me, sounds a little dated. Yes, it does. It sounds da- like you put it on now, you go, eh. Yellow Submarine, like some of those songs, Hard Day's Night. I don't know. It just doesn't exactly. It doesn't do it for Like, if you just start put that on now, you're like, ah, I don't really get it. But something like that, it, it, it sounds like it was recorded yesterday. Are you ever in the mood for it, even though it's dated? Or you can't listen to it at all? I can't really listen to it all. I'm like, ah. You know there are there are some songs obviously, but there's some that just didn't. They don't they don't sound fresh. Uh, yesterday I went over to my favorite fucking record store over here in Burbank. What's the one name of it? Atomic. Atomic. We went over and I, we, last time when Henry Rollins was in, I told Henry I usually go to Atomic, so I went in there yesterday. I had these albums at the house. I had doubles. You know you had doubles of shit people give you on the road. I went and picked up. Oh, dark side Look at of this, moon. dark side of the moon. Look at this. Oh, if a you monster. want blood, you got it. A monster. Oh. Pat Benatar. Oh, that's a good one. The first foreigner. Rumors. Stevie Nicks, the first one. But I had to take this one. This is a fucking master. Like this. Those Beatle albums, once they discovered the marijuana and the heroin, <laughs> and he started eating that fucking uh, Yoko Ono's asshole, <laughs> it changed. Like everything fucking changed. That's what happened. He ate Yoko Ono's asshole. Next thing you know, they were adding Chinese tunes. Hey Jude, Revolution, <laughs> Paperback Writer, I Should Have Known Better, Lady Madonna, Can't Buy Me Love, Don't Let Me Down, Ballad of John and Yoko Rain. This shit from, I think, Revolver, I don't know the exact thing. Give it a listen to. Give it a listen to. Just put it on YouTube one day. That shit, that, see, uh, Can't Buy Me Love and all that. I wipe my ass with that shit. It's like no, they're, they're, look. There's I some, fucking hate it. This I love all this shit. The bad company. This I love all this shit. I, I read the man who led Zeppelin, and he only managed Led Zeppelin and, and bad, bad company, company. Yeah. So I got back into bad company. Only the two but, bands that were on Swan Song at yeah, the time. Yeah, that's it at the time. Yeah. Now, do, as music fans, even though it, let, let's say you don't like the Beatles, do you still respect them looking back, seeing what they were able to do, or are you just like no? no like you, them? You're an idiot if you say to you know you can't respect the Beatles and the Beatles weren't that were overrated and, and were not good. I was just more of a Stones guy, because my, my older brothers brought that shit in the house. Whatever they brought in, I liked, and they brought more to Stones than the Beatles. Are your brothers still music guys like you? Yeah, yeah, you they still go to show. Oh go, yeah, hey, what the we fuck? just went to see Leonard Skinner's final tour. How was it? It was phenomenal. Phenomenal. Every song. My son knew half the half the fucking songs. Every song, one after another. I know this one. I know this one. I know this one. I know that one. It, unbelievable. I've been seeing them every year. You're a true fucking troop of love. It's great. You go to a concert. You have you tailgate. You have fucking beers in the parking lot. You bother people. The guy coming around trying to sell a bootleg shirt. You fuck with him. 
You know, he's, he's trying to sell them. But he goes, they're, they're $70 inside. I go, no, they're not. Then there's, there's never been a concert T-shirt that's $70 inside. You're selling it for 30 in the parking lot. If I see you after the show, you'll be giving it to me for $5. Give it to me for 10 right now before you get busted. And we just bust balls and fucking hang out and look at hot chicks walking by. Well, it was Skinner, there wasn't really that many hot chicks. but And it's fucking great. Then you go into the show, you're drinking beers and fucking listen to live music and they're actually playing. Nothing better. <clears throat> I don't hike. I don't fucking fish. You don't play golf. I don't play golf. Nothing of that shit. None of that shit. Your, your hobby is I go to concerts, I go to concerts and, Z, fu- and just drink some fucking beers and have a good time. I tell you, I haven't tailgated for a concert. I don't know how long. We get there like four in the afternoon. The show doesn't start till late. You get there at fucking eight. You know, you valet your car, whatever the fuck they do now. You know, it's a different experience than hopping on a bus to to forty eight, whatever the fuck bus drops you off at. And by the time you got to the city, that acid you took on the Jersey side <laughs> starts to kick in and you got to walk to the garden. You know, it's like an eight block walk to the garden. I forget what it was. That experience will be etched in my brain forever. I could tear up right now. Like I could tear up saying that that's never going to happen in my life again. Where I still remember going to see ACDC with Brian Johnson on a Friday night, it was August 1st, 1980. I still remember leaving the lumber yard at five, going home, washing my pussy, calling Kurt, God rest his soul, and I made him meet me at 29th Street and New York Avenue, the last bus place where you could take the bus into Jersey. There's a post office down the corner. And there was a guy in there, his name was Jack Finn. I worked with an Irish guy from Weehawken, New Jersey. This is in Weehawken, 29th it's, in New York. 29th in New York Avenue is borderline Weehawken, Union City. Yeah, because I lived on, right on Gregory Avenue. It's so the right last there. place you could uh, take the bus into Manhattan. Yeah. That's it. And then there's a bar there. It used to be called Otto's on the corner. And I'll ne- listen to me. I'll never forget going in there with maybe, you know, what did I have in those days. And we bought a half gram of Coke from Jack Finn. Jack Finn was the first person that I ever saw get coked up and make faces. <laughs> By the time I started making it took me three, four years to start making faces and start wiggling my hands. Jack Finn was in 1980, was already getting creeped up and doing shit. Like when you bring him in front of people, people go, what the fuck is this problem? Yeah, the guy's here. He's gonna be right back. He was creepy as shit. But you gotta, you got I'm gonna get you a gram. This shit's great, but you gotta leave something for the mouse. You know, so right. you, you would have to leave him two lines of coke. <laughs> and I still remember being whatever 1980 was. I was 17, and getting on the bus with Kurt. We bought a pint of blackberry brandy and an eight pack of nips, <laughs> and we drank yeah. them on the fucking bus like you just chugged them. Yep. Bus driver didn't say shit to you. You could be fucking. We were kids. Drinking those fucking beers on the bus. We split them and then we got <laughs> off on the Port Authority, went downstairs, and the whole walk. In fact, that was at the Palladium. That was not at the Garden. ACDC with Def Leppard, August 1st, 1980. We went to the Palladium. And I'll never forget, I was just telling somebody that you had to go. I was telling Timmy Holloway that you had a the cool people, the people who knew drugs, knew that if you went behind the Palladium, there was a fence that was ripped down and you could go back there before the show started and people were back there banging, drinking. Oh yeah, a lot really? of people didn't know about that. There was a little fence back there. So me and Kurt, this white kid, DiLorenzo, went back there, did a couple bumps. We finished the Blackberry Brandy. It was the hottest night ever in New York City. I was at that show. The hottest night I have ever, ever experienced. And I'm, I got jeans on, a t-shirt, and ACDC, Def Leppard came up and destroyed. And then AC, or it could have been Iron Maiden. It was either Iron no, Maiden. No, it was, it was Def, Def Leppard. Leppard, yeah. And then ACDC came out with the fucking bell. You know, and in those days, we used to do acid and then do blow. And we had a quaalude for later. I mean, it, it was over. I still remember walking home with such a high. ACDC was sensational. But that's that was my tailgate. And then I started going to where you 
where I, another concert that I went to that you went to where you threw a fucking cherry bomb. That was, yeah. Uh, uh, down at Asbury Park. <laughs> Convention Hall. Where Iron Maiden and Judas yeah. Priest. <laughs> when I heard that story, I had to pull over. Like, I'm honey, I was at that fucking show. Because there was a trend of people throwing fucking cherry bombs. The, and it was you. Always. The whole fucking- Firecrackers, cherry bombs, <laughs> M80s. But I never forget going to see the Stones and Foreigner at Philadelphia at the stadium. At JFK. Summer of 78. And at that point, we saw some kinky shit. But it wasn't until I went to see Dio with Sabbath and Sammy Hagar with Shaken Street down at Philadelphia where we were outside. That I tailgated for that one. At the Spectrum, yeah, because you could tailgate you could in that big parking lot. I'll yeah. never forget tailgating there. And we're out there with g Bow Coke blasting like fucking, like we own the place. And all of a sudden, they took us by the heads and they're like, FBI, open your trunks. We, we all had powder on us. We all had fucking quaaludes. We had everything on us. They made us open our trunks and they were looking for uh, shirts. The bootlegs. The bootlegs. The, the counterfeit shirts. And they didn't care about the drugs? They didn't give shit. They searched everything. They even found a package of Coke, left it. Jeez. Nothing. That's the concert where we stopped on McDonald's and we had like 13th row. But my buddy came back and he goes, look, I got six row tickets. I go, what did you do with those tickets? He goes, I traded them. I go, I'm going to fucking kill you. These are counterfeit. You just got taken. No, no, they were real, Jimmy Florentine. They were real. They were real. We went right up to the sixth row. We were watching people spit on their fingers in Philadelphia and fling it at Sammy Hagar. Sammy Hagar was so terrible with Shaken Street. Now, he was on tour at that time, and Ronnie Montrose was on tour on two different tours. So we got to see Sabbath. It wasn't Blue Oyster Cult yet that was opening for them. Remember? And then they went on the Black yeah, and Blue Yeah, the Black tour. and Blue. Yeah. This was still Sammy Hagar. And I'll never forget us looking around, tripping, and people spitting at their fingers, <laughs> flinging at Sammy Hagar. And Sammy Hagar, like, duck and spit from fucking people in Philadelphia. This is why when I saw the Bill Burr show 30 years later, I laughed my ass off. Because I go, that's nothing. I saw them spitting on their hands, <laughs> yeah. throwing it at Sammy Hagar. Who does that shit? <laughs> now, Jim, you said something a couple minutes ago that it wasn't a good. You didn't. It wasn't a good show to see girls. Did you guys ever meet girls at these shows? You didn't give a fuck. Well, for first that, that ACDC Def Leppard show, I remember Joe said that that was the hottest night in New York. Okay, so me and my friend took the train in from Jersey. Went to we're walking back to the garden after the show. We just bought seven ACDC shirts. We saved all our money. We got the baseball jersey. We got them all because we were so excited. We're going to buy every. So we walking back and we got mugged by three Puerto Ricans. They took our shirts. We're just talking. Oh my God, was that great? The encore. Boom. They, they punch us in the head. They grab our shirts and just walk away. They're bigger than us. And I remember yelling, go, Where the fuck are you guys going to wear those shirts? I'm like, What Puerto Rican is going to go back to his, wherever he is from and going to wear a fucking ACDC baseball jersey? Hilarious. The back in black fucking 1980 tour. No one's going to know that music. And, and, and they just left with our shirts. And that was that concert that Joey was at. Same concerts. But yes, you girls would hook up with you at the at these shows. There would be some girls that would come to the shows. You know, I, I remember, um, I, I, I don't know if I told this story. I put it in my book about the, seeing the Scorpions at the Spectrum. I I got front row somehow. It was a general mission. I got all the way up front. I went to go get some beers, and I saw this hot chick. And it seemed like she was by herself. I said, hey, you want to come in the front? I can get you in the front. We'll just switch tickets or whatever. Just follow me. Just keep walking like you know where you are, and we'll get right. So I get this girl right in the front. She's a nine on a scale of one to ten. And we're in the front row and the Scorpions comes out and we start making out before the, before the Scorpions come on. I'm like, holy shit, this is great. They're, they're on stage and she starts flashing the band. She's showing her tits. And the band's going, yeah, give me the f- thumbs up, giving her the thumbs up. I'm feeling her up during the show. I'm grinding my dick on her ass. We're making out. I'm sucking on her neck while they're fucking playing, you know, Love Drive. I'm like, this is fucking amazing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get laid after the show. I just met this chick. The Scorpions are going crazy. Right, the show ends. The ba- the uh, one of the roadies comes over. He goes, hey, the Scorpions want to meet you two. Come on, follow us. So I'm like, holy shit, we're going to meet the Scorpions. We get to the fucking door, and there's a big bouncer there. And she goes first, and then I'm going through it. He goes, no, no, just her. <laughs> and I go, no, no, they, the Scorpions said they, they want to meet us. He goes, no, just her. And I go, no, but I mean, he goes, no. and he just stand there my way. And the girl's walking. And I'm, uh, I think her name was like Emily or whatever. I'm like, Emily, Emily, they won't let me back. She never even looked back. Not even looked back. Didn't even look back. She was going back to the drink the blood. And I was mad at the Scorpions for taking my girl for like two years. I'm like, fuck them. I had a little radio show. I'm like, I'm not playing. I banned them. 
Meanwhile, I was like a four on a scale of one to ten. She was a nine. I was just lucky that she fucking she used me. But I'm like, poor. She's gonna fuck the scorpions. Who wouldn't? I don't ever think I hooked up or tried to hook up with a girl at a show. I took a girl to see Ted and ACDC at the Garden. I was at that show. That was <laughs> August fourth, the year before. <laughs> she the was hot as shit. This girl. I, I, Bond went through the crowd with Angus on yes, the shoulders. On the shoulders. Yeah, and, <laughs> I was blown away. I still remember going on the bus for that show, and people had the ghetto blasters on the bus, on the Kennedy Boulevard bus, all the way to, 20, you know, like all the way into New York with Highway to Hell blasting. That people would just, for that show, people went to the show just to hang out outside. It was cool just to hang out outside the garden in those days. Even if you didn't have tickets? Yeah. What the fuck? You never know what was going to happen. <laughs> you never know what was going to happen. If you just went over there, you were going to get it. There's somebody in New York that will take a $5 bill, open up a back door and go, once you're in, you're in. It's up to you. Like in the town, remember when they robbed the, remember when they robbed the Boston Stadium? In the yeah, town? Fenway Park. Yeah. Fenway Park. And the guy goes, you never fucking saw my face, okay? The same right. way. The guys will take 10, give me five apiece. Really? We get in? Yeah, but you got no tickets. You're going to get stopped. So you got to finagle. Or you could stand to the side. So I learned that if I took five gorillas, I had a hard time. But if I kept my mouth shut and went by myself, I'd go all the way to the top <laughs> for five hours. So a lot of those shows, I used to go on on a whim. Like, I, I don't need a ticket. I don't need a fucking ticket. Because I knew you were going. And you bought fourth row tickets. So I would just go into the city and buy $7 red seats, whatever the fuck they were, orange. And my goal was to sneak down to you guys. You guys would come up and get me. Yeah, and just and give him an extra me ticket. Give, give me an extra ticket. An, well, yeah, one guy would sit at the seats, and then he'd bring two stubs up, and he would give you the stub, the six, and then both of you guys would walk down. We've been doing that for years. For years. So it was fucking brilliant, because in my hometown, if you went to see Ted, AC, Judas, anybody, they were, we, we ran 40 deep. Not that we all, 50 of us, went together. But clicks from different parks. You had 88th Street Park, you had 51st Street Park, you had 43rd Street Park, you had 64th Street Field. So we'd see each other in the city. In fact, one of the famous things about my hometown was one of the guys, I think Randy Mergo, God bless his soul, had a North Bergen hat on at that show. Angus was real close to the stage. Randy took it off, threw it. Angus picked it up and put it on and did a couple things, took it off and threw it back to him. The kid almost had a fucking heart attack. That's the greatest. Like, the kid almost yeah. had a heart attack. Like, somebody from Lincoln School, something happened to him. And, I, and tomorrow, Timmy Holloway will call me and say, it was this, this. Oh, my God. How did you remember that? Do you think, it, like, someone has pictures from back then at these concerts and you might be in? Like, I wonder if you guys are in a picture together in, like, the crowd or something. How funny would that be? Like, it could be. Absolutely. We were at all those shows. All of them. Ozzy, you get right to the front. At the Palladium, to Sabbath at the Garden with Van Halen, to I think you went to Aerosmith at the Soap Factory when they were broken. They were just broken. They <laughs> yeah. were broken. They were yeah. down to nothing. They were like a fucking worse than like I just you sat there and said, What happened? Joe Perry was gone and they're at the soap factory in fucking this warehouse kind of place that was just a dump. After playing at the Palladium. After playing at the Garden for fucking Black Sabbath in yeah. Giant Stadium. Playing Giant Stadium and stuff. Yeah, they, they they fell that hard. They fell that fucking hard. It's so weird how when a couple weeks ago I was telling you I'm watching Ted on Joe Rogan. And it's interesting and people make fun of Ted Nugent and he's got crazy views and he did some fucked up shit. But let me tell you something, motherfuckers. Do some of your homework. And go back and bust out Cat Scratch, bust out some of the early Amboy Duke shit, like some of that shit, and then just turn on Double Live Gonzo, and all that feeling you had for Ted about that crazy shit he talks will disappear. As I know I did, I just had to be reminded. It's so weird how Lee doesn't know about a lot of people, not because he's dumb or because, because these people are really irrelevant. Like, there's a guy, this guy, I want to get on the show. You know who this is on that thing right there? Hollywood Henderson. Yeah. I want to get him on the show. If you go to his Twitter, he's got like, yeah, I need to get my story out there. Hollywood, I got bad news for you. First off, 
Nobody knows who the fuck you are. I, re I reached out to him and this producer to come on the podcast. I go, because nobody knows who you are. You might walk around thinking people know who the fuck you are, but nobody knows who you are. You're a forgotten soldier. He went to jail in 1980. That's right, for some coke or After trafficking a fucking or something. 10 year run of destroying LA. He was hanging out with Pryor and the Pointer Sisters, snorting coke in a limo at the comedy store. Went to jail in 1980. In 1990, he came out and he hit the Texas State Lottery. Not once, but twice. Really? I didn't know that about For him. For $30 million or something. So he opened up a rehab. He's clean and sober. But if you go to his Twitter page, it says, hey, man, uh, help me sell my story. Sorry, Hollywood. Nobody knows who the fuck you are. And it's a shame when I watch. Uh, Steven Tyler on Joe Rogan. It was one of the best podcasts I've ever watched. He was great life. on there, yeah. But the thing that rem that came over me the most was, Jesus Christ, how many of you people put on his first album with Aerosmith after you watched that episode? The first two, three, four albums are masterpieces. Unbelievable. Just Toys masterpieces. in the Attic, Rocks, uh, Get Your Wings. Get Your Wings. And the, the first, first Aerosmith. Just, just, and the sad thing is, we don't know them as that. Like, I feel bad introducing some of those bands because I feel, ah, these, you know, everything today is basically, and even Tool's like an old man band now. Now it's Get Red Again, and, you know, it moves so quickly. When did he hit the lottery? He, uh, let me see. He hit it, um, I believe in 79. Is that true, or did he... I'm sorry, because he he was in prison for 28 months and he won 28 million dollars. 28 million. 28 million. He was oh, no. like he hit it uh, in yeah. I'm trying to find the year he hit it. He was the modern day like Marshawn Lynch. You know, Marshawn Lynch is crazy and everyone knows him. That's how Hollywood Henderson was uh, being on the Cowboys, America's team, and he was just nuts. He was like the guy before LT. He was like LT nuts. Like he was a great player, but he was also crazy, always getting in fights and problems off the field and stuff he was amazing when he played but it was funny because i still remember when he took the, uh, the super bowl he took the can of orange crush and he smashed it he goes i'm gonna fuck you up in the super bowl and he took a can of orange crush and he smashed it and then in the super bowl he intercepted the ball and went in for a touchdown right and like if you read his books like he bought like a kilo that night <laughs> <laughs> I think he won the lottery in 2000, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, twice. Wow. Yeah, it was in Austin, Texas in 2000. Twice. Who wins the fucking lot? See, and people used to, a lot of people don't know that the gangsters, mobsters, high-ranking mobsters in the 70s, used to buy lottery. You know who else? Whitey Bulger won the lottery twice because they would put it on the neighborhood. If you hit the lottery, let me know. I'll buy the ticket from your cash, and I can clean my money. Ah. Uh. Really? That's why Whitey Bulger hit the lottery. Look at Whitey Bulger. He hit the lottery a couple fucking times. Even as, if you watch the movie, his brother even says to him one time, Really, Whitey? Again? You hit the fucking lottery for three million? Because they would come up to Jim Florentine and go, We heard you got the t ticket for three mil. We'll give you two mil cash. Then they'd probably stab you. Yeah. Then they probably give you a hundred thousand and stab you. Like Look, give you two hundred thousand what? There's a uh, article from nineteen ninety five in the Boston Globe that the FBI or something federal ordered the lottery to commission to withhold a portion of the fourteen point three million dollar jackpot that he won. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> for Paul Vario from Goodfellas bought a couple lottery tickets. Yeah, they paid two million cash for one half the share of the winnings. Taylor Walsh was notorious for buying lottery <laughs> tickets. Sammy the Bull Gravano. I didn't know they did that. That's, That's how they would wash the money. Tremendous way yeah, to wash your is. money. <clears throat> tremendous good, man. way to know. wash your oh money. God. Fucking crazy. <laughs> how do you find out about this stuff? What the fuck you think you're dealing with? When I was fucking 18, I was buying fucking passports. You get a social security card, a license, and an insurance card. Oh, yeah. I, I was getting in clubs when I was Baker. 15. I had fake IDs, all that stuff, a driver's license. In New Jersey, they had no white pictures. On yeah, there was license. no picture. So my brother was five years old. There you go. Me. And you stole the license from your brother. He got a temporary one. Then you gave the brother the one he lost back, and you carried the temporary one. Yeah, he just says, Who you the lost fuck it. Doing he with? gives me his. Yeah. Yeah. And it was only 18 to drink, so I was yeah. getting in at 15. I was so going to see. 15, they're looking at you going, mm, you, know, you look young. What sign are you? Yeah, like a. Taurus. Bam! You're in the fucking joint. <clears throat> At least you guys knew. I used to have play that trick on people at movie theaters, and they would never know. I would just ask them what, what their birthday was. 
I wouldn't even ask them what their sign was, and they they couldn't they didn't think about it beforehand. There was a bar outside, like the Palladium or the Garden or somewhere around there, where they would just, uh, you know, you were fourteen years old, would just go in there and get pitchers of beer and sit there before the, before we go see shows. We were fourteen. The girl would come over. We wouldn't sit at the bar. That was too risky. They know that these kid, they're fucking kids. And they come over, yeah, we need four pitchers of beer. Beefsteak Charlie's. Remember that was Beef next door Charlie's, yeah. to Madison Square Garden. We used to go there before a show and drink so much, and we'd puke into the pitchers <laughs> and then put them back and put them back on the table. Oh. And then fill them up again because all you can eat beer and food. Beefsteak Charlie started out good. Yeah, it started out good. But then people started getting, but this was before Salmonella. Yeah. People started walking out of there with their eyes <laughs> and foam coming out of their mouths and shit. And Beefsteak Charlie had like a weird haircut and he had like a mustache. So if you had a weird haircut in my neighborhood, people would call you Beefsteak Charlie. Like, Beefsteak, what's going on with that fucking head? <laughs> Beefsteak Charlie. I yeah, so, was, so we just get pictures of beer and, we, you know, they, my friends would puke in them and then put them back on the table. You want have, more beer. You have a young son, right? <clears throat> yeah. Because I, I, my dad would always, we'd always sit at the bar and get a Shirley Temple. We'd get fucking an appetizer. You can't do that to that. They, they won't even let you sit at the bar anymore. No. You, even if your dad's that there. That. That's crazy. They don't give a fuck. If they, as soon as they start serving alcohol, a minor cannot be in a bar anymore. Yeah. So if we're at the, let's say we go to the comedy store, and I bring Mercy with me. Mercy can hang with me at the store till 8 o'clock. At 8.01, Mercy has to step foot. As soon as they start a show, I got to pull Mercy out of there. In the old days, you could at least have him there. Yeah. Your kid could sit next to you. Fucking different world now, bro. Like if that's gonna stop you from drinking, who gives a shit? Exactly. So, can you guys send your your kids? I mean, maybe yours is a little older. Can you send him to a concert, or do you have to go with him now? No, I, we go together. He, we, I took him the to White Snake, Foreigner, and Jason Bonham. And Jason Bonham's band does all Led Zeppelin. It's phenomenal. And Foreigner and White Snake, and, and he uh, he shook David Coverdale's hand. We we're on like the side, like up close, but by the side. And then he got a set list from the guitar player, brought it over to him during the show. It's the fucking coolest picture. I got to pull it up. How old is your son now? He's seven. He's going to be eight on Saturday. So you're exposing them to all this music. He's he just saw Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie. He loved it. Now, when you smell weed, what does he <laughs> say to you? Um, he, he, no one's smoking that much weed, really. Like outside, there's not too much going on. It's weird. You know, if they're doing it, it's maybe at park a lot or whatever. I don't know. This is Jersey, so people aren't smoking as much weed as they are out here. Oh, okay. You know, so it's still it's still not to totally legal there, so people are kind of hiding it. It's more drinking. I smell weed once in a while, but you can't even smoke outside. At this is the PNC Art Center. It's in Jersey. It's an outdoor pavilion, but you can't even smoke outside there. There's like a designated area somewhere outside by a fence where you could smoke cigarettes, and that's it. But inside the venue, you can't even smoke, and it's outside. You know, they got a roof over it, but it's still open. I heard Dodger Stadium has a designated spot for smoking weed. I don't know how true it is. I don't See? know what the source is. I don't know if it's it's like, un, you know, you, you can't, you're not supposed to know about it. This is it David exists. Coverdale from Whitesnake. Uh, He's walking by, and my son reaches out, and he shakes his hand during the show. Unbelievable. When was this? This is like two months ago. Look at David Coverdale. Still looking it's fucking good. Still good. When are they releasing the album? There's a new album they have. Yeah, it's out. coming out in the fall. They pushed it back a little. Who's his new people? He has all new personnel? Tommy Orridge is still on drums. He's a monster. Still looks exactly the same. Plays the hand, play, Does a drum solo with his hands. Tommy Aldridge, he's been around since Ozzy. He used to play in Black Oak, Arkansas back in the Jesus day. Jesus Christ. So that's <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> How old are we talking about here? He's got to be 70. 75. 70. No, seven, the most he is is 72. I'd say somewhere 69 to 72. And he's still an animal on drums. He does a drum solo. And he plays with his hands half the time. I called Rudy today to see if he wanted to do some lunch, maybe get some Cuban food. And Rudy was taping something today and something tomorrow. And I got off the phone with him and I'm like, I bitch about my fucking life being busy. He's got me by 10 years or something, Rudy Sarzo. He's unbelievable. The guy's insane. The, the, you know, just the way it, he, he looks amazing. He hasn't aged a day in, in 30 years. And he's, he's out there performing, touring with all these bands, doing this, playing on this record. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, do you guys, and I, I guess just Jim, 
not bother you, but what 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 does it make? How does it make you feel when you go and see these people, and you remember seeing them as teenagers when you were teenagers in their in their twenties or thirties, and now they're sixties, seventies? Does it does it affect you or? I, it inspires me because then you know, you, as a comic, you always think, okay, I, I can't do this forever, and no one's gonna give a shit. But you know, when you see these guys still up there and touring and doing it. It's like why can't why can't we do it in our sixties right. if we really wanted to? Not tour as much, but still do it. Like I always thought, at some point, the people aren't going to listen anymore; they're not going to care. But if these guys are doing it and they still have a fan base that grew up with them, you know, as a comic, you have your fan base that grew up with you. They're going to get older with you, and they're still going to want to see you because it's still going to bring back good memories when they were younger. But they can't party as much. Or are there is there are there musicians who still party the same? Rarely, maybe you know a glass of wine afterwards, or maybe before. But they're not really doing it. They know it's a business. They you know when you're getting three hundred fifty bucks a ticket, you know is that really how much tickets? Some are? of them, you know, some of them if you sit in the first like twenty rows or so. Jesus. So Joey, just the, the guitar player when the White Snake ended, they're doing their bows. He took his set list off the floor and he ran over because he saw my son, like he was the only young kid in the front, and he handed up and I got a picture of that. So he handed him the set list from the White Snake uh, show. The guy ran over and just and gritted. And... That's tremendous. Isn't that great? That's amazing that you're exposing. He's gonna. Have, I mean, I can't imagine like when they go in and like, well, let's play this song. Let's play uh, Sweet Caroline. He's like, fuck that. Oh yeah, he he hates that stuff. I hate that shit. You know what was great about it? Like he was he, he knew like one foreigner song. Foreigner songs are so catchy. And so good, they're so well written. Within like a day and a half, he knew like three quarters of their set list, all the hits: "Dirty White Boy," "Hot Blooded," all that shit. Because they're such good songs, and they're easy to pick up to listen to. It's almost like ACDC. A lot of ACDC songs are quick. Like some young person, you want to get them into them. Something like Tool is going to be too too complex for them. That's like even the old Sabbath stuff. Then it's just too, it's all over the place. But something like a, a, a foreigner was just it was it was a, it was great. So he knew the whole fucking set list. Oh, let me. Ask they, you a I question. mean that shit too. That feels like the first time. Fucking. Great I got that stuff. first album. It's yesterday. Fucking phenomenal. Because I like that one jam. Uh, the fucking one based on War of the Worlds. There's two fucking great jams on the first song. Right. War of the Wor- World. And then it was a Monday. A day, oh, yeah, yeah. That's the day. Blue Monday, whatever. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Those first two, that album blew me the fuck away. Then the second one is Double Vision. Yeah. And that one's a little men's and men's, but still great. Yeah, still great A little bit stuff. commercial for me, but still fucking great, you know? So, yeah, yesterday I picked it up. Why haven't you ever picked up a fucking flute? <laughs> or a drum set? I tried everything. I got no talent whatsoever. None. I tried guitar. I tried guitar. All my friends were in bands. That's who I hung out with. I was a lefty. To like, I can't. I, I'm righty. Can you turn the guitar around? Like, no. No one could teach me because I was a lefty. I tried singing lessons. I went one time. The lady goes, "Look, you don't have it. I could take your money, but you just don't have an ear for music." She told me the first, the first, after the first lesson, I sang in my friend's band, like in his garage. I'm like, you suck. And I'm like, yeah, I do. So I just, I just couldn't play. Drums. I just don't have an ear for music. I love music, but I just don't have the rhythm for it. My son's got it. He's right, right down with it. He's playing the drums in music class. He's my, the teacher's like, Jesus, this, where the fuck did this kid get this from? My God, he didn't get it from me. So I just don't have it. I would love to. I was, you know, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a rock star. And then when I, you know, when I saw, you know, David Lee Roth being funny in interviews, and I would go to see Twisted Sister as a fifteen-year-old, and they have to do five sets a night, and Dee Snyder's, you know, killing time in between and just making fun of the audience and going on these raps, and he's being funny. I'm like, fuck, man, this is cool. And then when Dice and Kinnison came out, I'm like, fuck, these guys are like rock stars. That's when I was like, right, I'm doing comedy. That's nuts. But because I knew I wanted to be on stage, you know, somehow, cause, and I could, couldn't do it as a musician. I tried music. I was I had a good ear for the drums, all that shit. I could still play the drums naturally, just on the natch. Give me a couple of days to tighten shit up. Congas, anything percussion. I wanted to play the guitar, but something strayed me to the bass. I liked the bass player because he played in the back. Nobody knew what his name <laughs> yeah. was. Nobody bothered him. And even at a young age, I kind of liked it. I was like, these guy don't, these people don't bother nobody. And the bass player still gets chicks. And so. they still play it. He gets to fall over. Like, yeah, he's quiet. Yeah. Somebody's getting his dick sucked. He'll get right. somebody's too drunk. He'll get one, <laughs> one eye. Something. And I went to Pastor Music in Union City, and I took lessons there. 
But I knew as I got older, like I was like, I'm switching to the guitar. I knew that with the drug use and just who I was, I knew that I would pawn the guitars. Like as I got older, I go, I'm never going to be able to have a guitar because I'm going to fucking sell it. I'm going to run out of money and I'm going to sell it. So I never really got a guitar. But till this day, it's still like up on the bucket list, like just to take a few lessons and just play, you know. But I know that it won't affect me that way. It'll affect me like an addiction. Right. And then I'll start bringing the guitar on the road. And I'm that, that guy on the plane that has, has to, to carry the guitar. And that drives me crazy. Yeah, I hate that guy. I hate that fucking guy on the plane. <laughs> I know he's got to get his guitar. Listen, are you in Led Zeppelin? No. Then why do you have this guitar? Okay. Check the fucking guitar. You know, yeah. If they break it, it's probably your best bet. Yeah, it's not that, you know it's not like, that valuable. Stop it. No one knows who you are. And I, so I don't want to do that because I'll bring it the whole time. Because I could just see myself in the whole time. <laughs> yeah. From nine to fucking <laughs> quarter to seven playing fucking, uh, you know, Animals by Pink Floyd or something. So yeah. that's what scares me. We were talking about transfer of addictions. I picked that shit up like a fucking, you know, I just go now as it is. Like one week I eat fucking smoothies. One week I fucking eat acai bowls. Then I'm fighting Weight Watchers. Why am I fucking gaining weight when I, I eat an acai bowl? <laughs> so I always got an addiction to something every week. But yeah. music, it's funny. When we had Rollins in here. And I watched a bunch of his stuff. And he said something on one of the spoken words. And I don't know what it is about music that even lately this. Didn't you see I was here yesterday? Yeah. Oh, no. I came yesterday, last night. I've been coming by lately. And just putting it out. Putting the vinyl on. It's amazing. You know, like just putting vinyl on, reading the lyrics. Because of something he said. He said that. You know, think about it. Way before this fucking much joint therapy and the whole therapy thing. You know what our therapy was? Going to the record shop with the fucking money you save from your paper route. Coming home with maybe one of your buddies smoking a joint and playing that album back to back to back. And then be, because there was nothing like being the first guy on the block to go, I got it already. Not bad. And they were, you got it? Can I borrow it? Not really. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. Fuck you motherfuckers. You got to walk up the hill like I did. You got to make me fucking... Uh... But you know what? Today's the anniversary of... Today's a sad anniversary. Yeah, it's 30 days, 30 years since I got sentenced. But today in 1979, the last Led Zeppelin album came out. In through the outdoor? In through the outdoor. And it really fucked me up when I read that today. Nikki Six puts that shit out every day on his little... I follow Nikki on Twitter... All the shit that happened today. Oh, the Pretenders 2 released their album today. That was a great album. Yeah, that was a good one. That's yeah. a great album with Birds of Paradise. Uh, but In Through the Outdoor started a fucking chain of bad luck for me. Like, that was the kiss of death. Like, I still remember being at 38th Street Park, like, arguing with motherfuckers. Like, uh, in the evening, something he said, and somebody was going, ah, it sounded a little disco-ish. That guy that said that, I still remember his name. I don't know where he is. He almost got a fucking beating that day at that park. Like, that's when we argued about music and Led Zeppelin was the Bible. And this guy was like, I don't know. I don't like Into the Outdoor that much. Uh, that one song, Jimmy Pay, uh, Robert Plant says something. Shake for me or something, something. Like, dance. And this guy was like, they're, kind of, they're, sound, they're starting to sound disco-ish. Like, the Stones sold out in 76 and... I remember everybody just looked at that motherfucker. But three days later, I was in the hospital. That was my birthday, August 18th, yeah, 1979. Yeah, like three days later, I was in the fucking hospital for a lung infection. I had paraquat. They had sprayed the weeds. The government, if you grew weed, they sprayed it with a chemical, and it would give you a lung infection. I couldn't play basketball that year. Then fucking September, like a month later, he died. They had uh, John Bonham. John yeah. Bonham died you know, six weeks later. And I'll never forget that PLJ that Friday said, we're going to make an announcement pretty soon about a tour that everybody's waiting to hear. And I'm like, let's that's Led Zeppelin at the Garden. That's going to be 10 nights. Yeah. We're going to get tickets. That's when you got to mail in a fucking check and get four tickets in the mail. There was Because there was some concerts that you actually went and stood online for at Ticketron. Yeah. And I would always go to St. Peter's College in Jersey City because it was empty. Empty. You could walk right into St. Peter's. Everybody else was at all these other. Oh places. yeah, we had to go to the mall, like the East Brunswick the, Mall. The East we Brunswick. Went to, oh my God! And wait outside of Bamberger's. Fuck. 
fuck. And then we'd have to be, they'd open it up because there'd be a line way out the door, like the, you know, the night before. We were in line for like 16 hours. Jesus. So there wasn't like a, there wasn't a, a church or a college near us where we can go where no one went. Everyone went there. Yeah, we went, we went, I, I still remember when Pink Floyd, the wall went on sale. We went somewhere first and the line was around the corner. And my buddy goes, you know what? There's one at St. Peter's Prep. Nobody goes there. We shot right in, walked in, and we got first row up on the top, looking straight at Pink Floyd in the first level up. So they're perfect. Yeah. You're not in the orchestra. You're a level up. They were perfect. We just walked in there. Those tickets were $15.50. Fuck. You, got, you said something interesting. Like when you were fighting, did you guys have friends maybe all the way up until 6th, 7th, 8th grade, and then you find out they like a band you don't like, and then... They're done. Done? No. Done. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Absolutely. <laughs> like I had a buddy who was a big Van Halen fan, and I was in for the ride. But after <laughs> women and children first, we became enemies for a year. <laughs> like I, I once I went in his house and I saw the poster on the wall with David Lee hanging. Oh yeah, yeah, it was kind of inside the uh, women first. He came with a poster, yeah. and he was hanging in the corner with no shirt with on. With no shirt on. Yeah. If you were a man and you put that poster, yeah. if you were a man and you put that poster up, I wasn't coming to your house no more. You understand me? <laughs> Yeah, that I, definitely was. I, I'm a Jersey dude. I, you invite me into your house, I look at two things. First off, I open up the refrigerator. If you got my Luke <laughs> hot dogs in there, I'm done with you. You better have sad Brett's or something from the local Sabrats, bakery. Sabrats, those crunchy fucking hot dogs. Oh, with, with the, the string hanging out. Oh, with the little tail. Yeah. With the mouse tail. And then, and then I went through your record collection. And if you had Cheap Trick, or like Jethro Tull in there, or something like that. We were gonna have a problem. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly who the band. But you like if you had Journey in there, it was no yeah, show. you gotta get. Yeah, we're done. I can't date you no more. Like I can't date you no more. Like, like the Stones were okay, but you couldn't. You couldn't have Journey. Pat Benatar was okay. You could. Nah, I had Pat, but I had to hide him. Wow. Well, well yeah, that was first time you, I heard Crimes of Passion. I got. I got to buy that. I, yeah, I I, yeah, that. that's probably something you would have had that high. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you couldn't really have that around your friends. But yeah, if you had Journey in there, and then can well, no, Kansas was okay. I had a buddy who caught a beating for putting my Sharona on, like he caught right. a fucking ferocious beating at from a party who? from a friend of mine named John Crowley because <laughs> Crowley was tripping on acid and wanted to put on uh, Dark Side of the Moon because he would do the whole chandelier bit in the beginning, and this kid's like, nah, we're putting on my Sharona, crack. He just held off and fucking punched him. You know, I had friends that would go into your house at parties and just, like, if you had Springsteen on, they would just come in, take the fucking thing off, and throw the Springsteen album up in the air. Like, I grew up at that part of New Jersey. Like, there was no Springsteen. I had a friend that I'm uh, friends with since first grade, and he was a big metalhead, and we go to all the shows, and all of a sudden he started dating this girl, and he went to a Springsteen show. I didn't talk to him for two years. Yeah, that's it. I no. didn't talk, seriously, I didn't talk that's to him for two it's years. All, we got nothing to talk I can call him right no now, and he'll verify it. He's like, you he's still, he goes, you motherfucker. I go, I don't care. You went to see Springsteen. You went to see Springsteen. Like, that was unacceptable. You can't do that. It was unacceptable. You just went and saw Sabbath last week. You can't go see you Springsteen. You can't do that. And this is when, like, that 1984, whatever, uh, Born in the USA came out with, like, you know, Glory Days and fucking Dancing in the Dark, which, you know, Done. horrific song. Done. 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 Like, we didn't talk. To you. you weren't even allowed to play that enough. No. Like, there was one guy who liked Springsteen that was the bartender, John Kelly the Frog, because he had a little ball under his neck as a kid, <laughs> and he bartended on Sunday nights. I told you, every time you turned around, like, he would have to... Bartend and have his eye on everybody. Like he would take out. What, what can I get you? Two Heinekens. All right. And he would be get, looking around because every time you know, I ordered like a cocktail, if he turned, we throw ice cubes on him. Like if he put right. Springsteen on the jukebox, oh, forget it. Like that was the year when uh, fucking Motley Crue released uh, "Looks to Kill." Yeah, that's shout out the bar, devil. Rock. This bar where I hung out at was the loudest record player, and he was proud of it. Cork you. When you would call a thing at Corky's, the loudest record player in the tri-state area. I mean, you couldn't even talk in there. And looks of kill would go on, and we would lose it. And if any other song would come on, like The Dangerous Life was big with Sheila E. Yeah. She wants to be, that one we could live with. Yeah. But as soon as Glory Days came on, Born to Run or something, we would start throwing ice cubes at John Kelly because we knew he's the one that put that fucking music on. The only Springsteen song I liked, I never told nobody. It was like a secret I had, like if someone, like if I sucked a dick at Catholic school. Right. It's the same type of secret. That's a big if. Yeah. Right. 
I can leave cracking funnies. How'd you like some fuck? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, I didn't tell nobody. I like Tenth Avenue Freezer. That wasn't a bad song. I loved it. That, yeah, that was I a, loved it, but I didn't tell nobody. No, you, you couldn't. Me? I couldn't tell nobody. I would do. I was doing construction at the time. If, if I was on a roof, putting the roof up, and Springsteen came on, the radio was on. I would jump off the roof. I wouldn't even use the ladder to get the fucking the, shut it off. Who can no get idea. to the radio the quickest to, to get have that pull off? That shit off. Oh my god! You have no <laughs> fucking idea. Can you guys talk about the jukebox? Because now it's kind of like. I don't know. I don't know if I've ever put one. Maybe once or twice. Was it a big deal in the bars when you were going? If up? you had old music at a jukebox, like we didn't go to your jukebox. Like the month, like we tell you one time. Listen, bro, you got to start getting some new music in there. Yeah, you can't have you know fucking Bill Haley in yeah, the comments. You can't have fucking that old uh, shit. You know what I mean? It was good, but you don't want to hear it in a bar. Oh, I remember one time my friend up. went off at a bar because they had Jimmy Buffett on. Yeah, wasted yeah. away Margarita yeah, though. That Take work. that shit off. That shit doesn't work in Take Jersey. Take that shit off. Take it off right now. I'll bust that fucking thing one oh time. Oh my god! How much money would you guys spend a night? Eight, nine, ten dollars in quarters. Because for a quarter, you got three songs. Oh shit! Oh yeah, that's a lot of songs. So I would play "Looks to Kill" three songs. A four, A four. If I saw a pretty girl, she came over. Here's a dollar. Go put on A four ten times. A four, A four, A four, A four. Looks to kill. Looks to kill. And if you fucking slipped the Springsteen song in there, we would fucking eyeball you to death. <laughs> Disco. We listened to disco before fucking spring. Yeah, because the days. disco, you knew if you knew the songs, you can rap with chicks. You might have to dance them in a club, and you're gonna get laid with knowing the disco stuff. So that was okay. If some guys in there, he's putting Springsteen and this goofy shit in the jukebox, we just load it up with like fucking ten dollars worth of metal. So his songs would never even come up. We just keep fucking pounding away, like Joey said, three songs in a row. Looks to kill, looks to kill, just so you wouldn't hear his shit. And then did you see last week on Twitter? I was going back and forth with a girl named Judy Kelly. I and I said, so. Judy, uh, we were old. We had some type of con conversation. And she goes, we're, we've come a long way. And I go, we're really old. I go, I just want to apologize for lighting your bunny rabbit on fire in the what? back of the car. She had a, not a run, <laughs> bunny rabbit, a, oh. a stuffed animal. Thank so God. So she right. used to date John Kelly the frog. So they <laughs> broke up okay. because she cheated on him down the shore. So he gave her a bunch of stuffed animals. And she put it in the back seat because she was in love with him. She got drunk one night and made a mistake. And, you know, John held it against her. He wouldn't talk to her. Right. So we were all out one night at the Cuckoo's Nest up in Nyack, New York, before the fuck, before there was anything. There was only two things in Nyack that you went up to. Just to that club. And when I used to bring the hot cars to Joe the Arab, he was the only Arab in the district. That's when being Arab was cool because there was only one Arab. Yeah. If you knew an Arab, they were dynamite. You know Joe the Arab? Yeah, I know Joe the Arab. <laughs> he was all right. A bunch of Arabs come down. Nobody likes him. You know what I'm saying? But then... <laughs> Like one, two hours, everybody loved Jody Arab. And Jody Arab loved everybody. You know, he'd hit you with my friend. He, he knew all the slogans to fucking, <laughs> to beat you. And you didn't care because he was Jody Arab. You like doing business with Jody Arab. You don't take your cars to Nicky no more. Fuck Nicky the chink. He don't pay me what he <laughs> pays, what Jody Arab pays me. You know what I'm saying? He's tight. So that's the only reason I would go to fucking <laughs> Nyack. So one night we're up there coked up, and she's in the car doing coke with us, and there's three gorillas in the back seat, and there's a girl in the front seat, Lisa Tiz, and there's Judy Kelly, and we're back there talking, and Judy Kelly's, she would get drunk, and she I'm thinking about John right now, and she put on fucking Bruce. And I'll never forget, me and my buddies looked at each other, and I took one of the stuffed teddy bears, and I just lit that motherfucker on fire in the car. <laughs> And she's like, what are you doing? We're like, we don't fucking listen to Bruce. Get that shit off. <laughs> what would you do if like you were walking and you saw like three or four people in Bruce shirts or like you like there was a Bruce concert? Boom, Boom. say shit, fuck you. Dude, Boom. I got I got, I got a, a bumper stickers made up. There is no reason for Bruce Springsteen. And another <laughs> one, the boss is a total loss. And I got like a hundred of them and I would walk around, I'd stick them all around the town. And if anyone had a Bruce Springsteen bumper sticker in a parking lot, I'd, go, I'd cruise parking lots. I'd put it over their fucking bumper sticker in a parking lot. I was out of my mind. I had bumper stickers. I had these stickers that said on the seventh day, God created oh, yeah. Black Sabbath. Yeah, you'd get them at the English Town Auction. <laughs> yeah! The fucking funny races. I would buy them by the hundreds. <laughs> and if I knew you didn't like Black Sabbath, I would put it on your fucking yeah, car. A week later, you'd be out there with a razor blade. You motherfucker. <laughs> 
It's because you could buy them for like fucking oh. a, a 10 cents a piece. Oh my God. She had stacks of them. It was Ted Nugent, the eight day guy, yeah, Black I'm, Sabbath, I'm Ted day. Nugent, yeah. ACDC. Judas Priest, yeah, just stick them on people's you cars. You took your fucking. Co- we took my music so serious. Oh yeah. Then there was a guy in my neighborhood who I still love, Guy Tabasco. <laughs> I still talk to him. And he had a brother, Mike Tabasco, who actually thought he was Eddie Van Halen, but didn't play the guitar. So we would torment him every day. What's going on, Eddie Van Halen? And every day, there used to be an argument with the Tabascos and somebody <laughs> over Eddie Van Halen. We would just talk. And once Randy Rhodes came out, oh my God. We started tormenting Eddie Van Halen fans. But the ones that suffered the most growing up, and I told this story to Dean Delray, were Beatle fans. Because I still remember taking a hit of acid, going out, and my friends were ho-hum, so I went home. And my mother was dead. I'm sitting there with Mr. Bender, tripping my balls off. And they just said John Lennon got shot in front of the Dakota. And I, dog, I went to school the next day. Now, in my school, they fucking hated Springsteen. But I'll tell you who else they hated. It was the Beatles. John Lennon wasn't dead 12 hours. I still remember walking into my school, and towards the back by the by the theater, there was a mural of the Beatles. Somebody had already put an X <laughs> through John Lennon, and we were fucking howling. <laughs> like, my school didn't hesitate right. one minute to let the Beatles know, the Beatle people know you're fucking done. Because at that time, there were Beatle people and Springsteen people, and they weren't the same. So you always at war with Springsteen people and be fuck you with the fucking Beatles. You go to a party, oh let's put on the paperback writer. I don't want to. I want to get my dick sucked. I don't want to listen to paperback writer right now. Where's fucking? We once we got hooked on it was Double Live Gonzo was the first one that hooked us. Yeah, that was on for two or three years of the party. You could have whatever you want on your party till we walked in, and then you better put double live guns on it. There's going to be a fucking problem. Will thing. you bring your own records to parties? No. We would just tell you, you don't have double live guns? Yeah, okay, you put- we got to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, we'll go get it. My sister's got it upstairs. Put it on. Jeez. So it was double live guns. And then I'll tell you what group took over my town for like a year, uh, six months. That first album was awesome. Awesome album, A to Z. B 52s, the first album with Rock Lobster. Oh, yeah, Rock Lobster in private went, Idaho. Like 80, 81, after Sabbath, like when we were waiting, we were in the limbo waiting for Ozzy. Boom, B 52s. I still love that album. I still play it. I still got it. One That's of my great. I, 52 Girls, uh, Rock Lobster, Planet Claire. Tough. Yeah, I mean, you know, they lost it later with, you know, yeah, Love yeah. Shack and shit like that. But no, that was, that, that was another thing because you. You know, if you couldn't get girls that were in hard rock and metal, you would get like new wave or disco because then you could talk to girls. You knew the songs. You'd have to go to the clubs. Maybe you went to like the new wave club or the disco club to go talk to. So you needed to know that music. You weren't getting laid listening to Bruce Springsteen like you didn't have to. So that didn't affect us. So, But the B-52s definitely because new wave was starting to play in the clubs and all the girls were going to those clubs. So we needed to go get pussy. dance with them and shit. And yeah, you go like dance a, with them. I went through a whole new wave stuff. phase. Yeah, it's like, I got, you know, I was talking to girls about Judas Priest and they were just fucking walking away the from cars. me. The cars. Was another women love cars. The women love cars. Women love cars. But I'll tell you what, Van Halen, I saw Van Halen and I got to tell you guys, that's a date and a place I don't remember. It was after two, maybe. So seventy nine between seventy nine and eighty, because Van Halen two came out in seventy nine. After Sabbath, like after Sabbath broke up. Right, that was seventy eight. Was the first one, the first so Van Halen. Seventy nine was Van Halen two. Women and Children was nineteen eighty. So I saw them maybe before Women and Children, and there was a lot of hot fucking blondes there. All the, the Van Halen was the band there that was, brought in the chicks. There was a lot of hot chicks. Oh yeah. But then something happened in 19 fucking 81. I started hanging at this bar when I was like 16 called Joan Mary's. And there was one motherfucker that you couldn't talk shit about or you were going to get into a fist fight at all those bars because they were old timers. And in those bars, they have a thing called white trash people that are very nice. They're just white trash people. In those days, before you got there with your heavy metal and shit, they had a guy by the name of uh, Kenny Rogers on there. And you couldn't touch Kenny Rogers' music. Kenny Rogers is for people. When you were 18, if you were 30, you were listening to Kenny Rogers to get your dick sucked. Kenny Rogers put out two or three songs that are dick sucking music. So one day, believe it or not, some guy came up to me that was a little yeah. older. He goes, do you want to go see a Kenny Rogers concert? At that time, I was a young Jim Florentine. <laughs> I went to see anything. 
I didn't, I seen Huey Lewis in the news. Yeah. There was a time I went to see anything just for the art of the live, like the pretenders when she broke her leg and Coney Island, then she did the garden the next night, she threw the crutches into the audience. I went to see the new barbarians with the stones. I went to see I went to see James Brown's at the Palladium. I went to see you two at the I went to just people that I didn't know. It became so open for me. What the fuck was I gonna say? What the fuck are we talking about? Girls, bars, man. I went to a Kenny Rogers concert. All right, what they got, yeah. That was the capital of women passing out, sucking dick while they were passed out. <laughs> Kenny Rogers wasn't even giving out Cosby pills. <laughs> and bitches were passing out, <laughs> sucking his dick. Really? Dog, when he sings, Lady, I'm your knight in shining armor, and I love you, he had like two songs, two or three songs that you look around and women were fucking crying. Crying, like fucking crying, like ready to suck dick. Like, give me, give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> give me that fucking cock juice. It was crazy. I left there going, oh my God, I just learned about women. Like, I always, and I, and I, honest to God, I never went to a concert to pick up a chick. I don't think I ever picked up a chick. Well, because most of the shows that we went to, there was not hardly yeah. any girls. But then when you started going to show, more shows like that, there were. I, I get into the police. The police would draw a lot of chicks. That synchronicity tour, all the women were into it. It was a big hit on MTV. I got jerked off on like the twenty yard line at at JFK Stadium in Philly during a police show by some girl I don't even know watching the show. It was in the middle of the day. I don't know why the police were on during the day. I remember it being light, and she was just jerking me. And we we're both just watching the show, looking straight ahead. And I came. I came on the twenty one yard line. Did you come on the floor? You I think it was. I think it was sick synchronicity too. No, we're right, right on the twenty one, right on the floor. Yeah, you, know, you juiced on the. Oh floor. yeah, absolutely. To me, I put it right back in the pocket. Well, I did afterwards. Like mushroom yeah. juice. <laughs> you get home, there's a mushroom between your legs, and you got a rash and shit. <laughs> but that's how it was. Like I just met some girl there at the show, and then we started making out. Where we're watching a show, and she just jerked me off watching a band. It was great. You ever and then, I, then I said, "I'll go get you a beer," and I never came back. Please. That's yeah. That's when you tell them. I'll be, yeah. be, yeah, be, 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 be right back. Yeah, you don't have to come. Just stay here. Yeah. So no one Once takes. Once they our suck your dick, that's it. The relationship's over. Yeah. What am I gonna do? You know, what are we gonna then do? Then they'll see you on the way out. What happened to you? You're yeah. not gonna believe it. Yeah. If I see you in a park, I go. Let's go get a Philly pretzel. <laughs> yeah. I think I know the answer for Joey, and I don't even know if they had him back then. But did you guys go to like any of these big uh, festivals, like camping festivals, for any of these concerts or no? No, I went to the Woodstock. Uh, Woodstock ninety ninety four. They actually had like a they had a comedy tent there. Oh, you comedian. performed? Yeah, it was all disorganized, so like nobody even showed up. It was, but but I did go there. They had a bunch of comedians, like twenty of us from New York, went up for that. We stayed in like the artist tent. It was great. They had a co-ed ba- co-ed shower, so these you know guys and girls go in the shower like the artists. So me and the other comics were just waiting outside the shower, just fucking waiting for women to walk in. And then we just go in there. We, we took like six showers in one day. <laughs> Who performed in Woodstock? Me, Bob Levy, Don Jameson, um, Red Johnny and the Round Guy. I don't know if you guys remember those guys from New York. Uh, Danny Vermont, who was Danny DeVito. Danny Vermont still writes for Politically yeah, Correct. Yeah, love Danny. I just bumped into him. Great dude. Danny's been around a long time. Yeah, Rich Voss went with us. Eric McMahon. You know, Jersey, New York comics. Most of the guys that had a comic strip, but there was like 20 of us. Took the bus up there, hung out for three days. Now, what happens at the Jim comic Dorton was there, now? too. Do you guys even go to the comic strip anymore? I walked in there for the first time in like 10 years, uh, about a month ago. And it's just, I don't know. It's just it got a weird vibe to it. I don't do any sets there. Where do you do all your sets when you're in the, the stand? Seat? Okay, but the stand is moving. Yeah, it's closed for the summer. So I, be, I went back to the Comedy Cellar in the Village Underground. I've been doing sets there. Um, usually I just stay at the stand. I just love that club. You but got I'll, it down to a science. After I spoke to you last week. Yeah. You go out every two weeks. Two weeks. Out of and the, you have your child, your yeah. boy, your son. And then there's one week that you just do spots in the city. Yeah, I got I got my son one weekend a month. I got him early in the week. I got him 50% of the time. But I got him one weekend. I got him for a full weekend. So I take that weekend off. I spend it with him. I got one weekend. I go. I do sets in New York City. And then two weekends, I'm on the road. So I'm out like eight days out of the month. I'm home for 22. It works out perfect. How did you learn this balance? As you get older, you just like, I, I don't like being out that long. Even when I was, uh, you know, 
15, 20 years ago doing stand-up. I didn't like being out that long. I need to go get back home and just recharge and get away from it all. You know, so I, and now as you get older, you're just like, no, I can make my own schedule. I can do whatever the fuck I want. This is before your son and even before. Yeah, before my son. But girl, yeah. And then, you know, I went on tour with those bands. I've got, you know, I was out for like a month at a time. I hated it. 30 days on the road. I don't know how these bands do it. 45 days and shit being on a bus. So I was like, no, nah, man, that's not that's not for me. So I just, you know, two weekends. That's enough. I don't want to get burnt out. I don't want to get burnt out on my material. I don't want to be doing you know, just feel like I'm mailing it in. So re I recharge the batteries, just fucking hang on my son, play, you know, do anything but comedy. Don't think anything but comedy. I hang out with my, my neighbors that live in the suburbs and we just talk fucking, you know, schools and just get away from it all. And then when I'm ready to get back up there, I'm recharged. Yeah, I, uh, I had to cut it down to two weeks a month. I had the perfect balance right now because first I was telling him two weeks a month, but this motherfucker would do two back to back have a week off, and then two back-to-back. -back. So I was really doing five, four out of five. Right. That's still murder. No, it's still, yeah. It's still murder. So I had to look and, and, and see what worked for me. And now, yeah, I love to go out every fucking weekend. Yeah, you do, like, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I you, love it, you but I can't. come home Sunday. I can't. I can't. Uh, but you do, it, you do it two weekends a month I do on two the weekends a month. Yeah. And, I, and my body, it takes four days. Like, right today, I feel great. Like today, I feel great. For two days, my sleep was off. I still worked out. I still did what I had to do. But today was fucking great. Today, I'm tip-top Magoo. Now I got another week. Then I go to Alabama next Thursday. Then I go to Nashville Friday and Saturday, and I'm home two weeks. Yep. You know, I like that. I, and people, agents get mad at you or whatever. You know what, man? I got a family, and it, I'm a different animal now. I wish this would have happened at 32. You right. wouldn't see me. If this happened at 32. <laughs> I know, yeah. You would the same. I'm on a plane on Tuesday, picking up a one night of Wednesday, Thursday. Absolutely, getting in town a day before. Yeah, why not? Town a day before. Yeah. Get a good steak. Go around the town. Go to a record store. You got it. You do Kansas City at all? Ain't I haven't Kansas done it in a while. Book yourself. I love in Kansas, no, I love City Kansas City because they have. Well, Dean Delray went to this fucking vintage T-shirt store in Kansas City. They got. It. You're, gonna, you're gonna drop a grand. You're going to drop a grand. Oh, it's the ones where they cost like 150 They did a real shirt. The real shirts. Okay. The real shirts. I mean, he had, he was sending me pictures. They had the shirt I bought the opening night of Pink Floyd, the baseball shirts, because the baseball shirts got popular for a while. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the baseball shirts. I had a yeah. red and white Pink Floyd one that a friend of mine still had about 10 years ago, and it had shrunk. It was like a baby shirt. Yeah, you couldn't can't believe fit them I couldn't fit them anymore. Yeah. No. And it was still an XL or an L. It was like an L, but the fucking cotton had shrunk over the years. The moth had eaten away at it. I had Ted Nugent Weekend Warriors in a baseball jersey. Did you? Yeah, I remember. And then after a while, like, you know, 10 years after that, the, you can't fit in them. So I wound up chucking them one time. I never should have done that. I no. had tons of them. Blizzard of Oz with the crosses on the back of the shirt with the tour dates and all the different markets and shit. Yeah, I, all that stuff. I had a friend that used to make T-shirts. He worked at a sporting goods called Levy's. And he, that's what he did. He really was a stock boy, but he would fucking get high and make us shirts. And we'd all wear the same shirts to a concert like the fucking fags. <laughs> <laughs> and I still yeah. re remember for Ozzy, I wore Suicide Solution with two lines of Coke on it. I mean, people must have thought me and my friends were fucking retarded. Like, <laughs> like thank God my mother was dead. <laughs> Not because <laughs> on paper they look like two joints. Right. But they're really two lines of Coke. Like he forgot to put the straw next to it. But it was like we had a shirt that said instead of it, the front said Judas Priest, but the back would say Jesus Christ, which meant Judas Priest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking he used to make all these shirts and people come up to us and go, where'd you get them? I wish I saved those shirts today because nobody had them. Nobody. Nobody. He'd do this weird stuff where he'd cut a picture out of Tony Iommi, do this, do that. This is before computers, Lee. This is by copying machine and fucking hand. And it was like, the, the I mean, Tony Iommi, he looked like Fidel. We used to goof on him and go, who's that? He did. Yeah, Fidel he did. or Black Sabbath? And we would laugh, but it didn't matter. And he would make 10 shirts for every show for us. I still remember he made them for Yes. Remember Yes? He used yeah. to come to the garden every year yeah. when we were kids and do like 10 fucking nights and... I was never a big Yes fan. It was too it was too cerebral for me. 
I like. I like some of this, a couple of songs, but I was Roundabout. Wasn't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all that shit. You know, the one then they the got F more songs. commercial, and the owner were, of a Lonely Heart, and all that stuff later. I'll never forget that. I went, I was going to see them for a while. Like, I, I remember going in the eighth grade, going to see them and being pissed because I had to miss Roots. Roots was on the oh, same shit. week as, and I had seen like two nights of Roots, and I was hooked. I wanted to see what happened when they got to the, uh, America. But Yes played. But Yes played like six nights at the Garden. And the first couple of years I went to see Yes, it was always packed. And then the last two or three years, people were giving you seats. Like, Yes was coming too much. Yeah. Like, people yeah. were coming every year, September 14th. They came every year the week that school started. That's what I remember about Yes Okay. Up. They always came to the Garden September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Five fucking nights. Did you go see Judas Priest on the British Steel Tour, the five nights in a row at the Palladium? No, I, I think I was living in Florida at the time, because it was 1980. 80, yeah. So I, I saw him at the Meadowlands with Iron Maiden, maybe, I guess it was maybe Scream for Vengeance Tour. That's the first Or, or Point of Entry. No, no, I saw him earlier with Maiden with Paul Diano at that show. Right, at I the was Palladium. With, yeah, yeah, yeah at the no, at uh, uh, Convention Hall in Asbury. Okay, now you didn't see the one at the Palladium with that. I don't think so. I s maybe I, I might have saw, saw that. I saw Killers at the Palladium, but I don't know if it was if they were opening up for. That's why I asked you when you said ACDC August fourth, August first, nineteen eighty. I wasn't sure because it was ACDC, but I wasn't sure if it was Def Leppard touring High and Dry. No, it was definitely Def Leppard because I moved like to Florida like August twenty eighth, nineteen eighty. So I was still around in the area to see those shows before I moved. I see Black Sabbath with Dio. It's their third to, third show ever, right? I don't like that Dio took over Ozzy's place. I, I was an Ozzy guy, so I was like, I was mad. But Heaven and Hell comes out, and it's a great record. So I'm like, you know what? I, I got to give it to him. I was rooting for it to fail. I was just, and I was totally, fuck, fuck Ronnie James Dio, Ozzy. I remember Miami Arena, me and my brother go, and before the show, we stop off at like some party store and we get a tablecloth, a white tablecloth, and we get a black magic marker and we make up our own sign. And we write, Ozzy is God. Dio must pray to him for forgiveness. We sneak it in the Miami arena. It was like general mission. It was only like 3,000 people there. Sabbath was kind of on the de decline then. You know, and they're just starting to make a comeback. And we get like in the second row. And Dio comes out, and he's, they open up with War Pigs, and I'm mad. I still think Ozzy's going to come out. I still think Furious. Ozzy's going to come out for some reason. I'm like, because there was no internet back then, so you didn't know. I knew he was out of the band, but I'm like, you never know. Maybe Ozzy will come out. And they all three of them come out, Bill Ward, all those guys, and then all of a sudden Dio comes out. Hits little the short guy. Little short guy. So we're holding the banner and up. doing all this shit and going, General's Gavin. In their masses. Yeah, and he was fucking up the song. So Ozzy had the peace signs. That was cool. Dio had the, the metal, the horns. The Maluk. They, they're, they're good now. But, you know, at that time, it was like, come on, man. You're, you're, it's a derivation of whatever it is, of, of Ozzy, the peace signs. The peace signs were cool. So we're holding the sign up, right? And and Dio come over and he's looking at it. He's giving us the finger. He's like, fuck you. At the sign, me and my brother are holding it up. And he's going to pretend like he's jerking off. Fuck you guys. By the second song, two big black security guys go come here and take us fucking bring us in the back they bring my brother in a room i'm like um what 15 at the time 16 they bring him in a back room like these three big guys and it, and they lock the door and i'm i'm crying i'm like leave my brother alone like because they're, they're holding me back they wouldn't let me in there five minutes later they bring him out bring me they bring us to a side door they throw us out in the fucking parking lot like garbage we got kicked out of the show because fucking Dio was complaining over the over the sign. Now I never told him. See, now I've, I'm friends with Dio because I'm I know Rudy. Rudy introduces me, and then he's on that metal show. I'm like I can't tell him that story because about a year before he died, this is 25 years later. He does an art uh, an article in a magazine. They go, "Did you get any backlash from?" When you replaced Ozzy, he goes, no, the fans are pretty cool. He goes, I can remember one time, it was early on the tour, there was a there was a sign, this banner was really bugging me, something about, like, Ozzy is God, and I got to pray to him for something. I, I, it just really was getting under my skin. I fuck, it, it drove me crazy. He goes, so there was some times with that, and I'm like, holy shit, that was the fuck of my banner, mine and my brother's banner. But I could never tell Dio, because be, I'm now become, you know, kind of friendly with him. I can't go, hey, I was that fucking asshole. At 16, that angry kid that was mad that you were in the band and not Ozzy. Everybody was... This was a very weird 
feeling for people because it was almost it was for the for the Black Sabbath and Ozzy and Dio. It was almost like Trump Hillary. You were on one side or the other, and that was it. And you'd fucking fight somebody. Like I still remember doing acid and stopping at a magazine store. And there was an article in there about Sabbath that just drew me over the loop. Like, I had nothing. I had no parents at the time. And my whole life was listening to Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath was keeping the glue together, as scary as it sounds. It was all Sabbath, buddy Sabbath. Nobody will ever tell you the reasons why. Right. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I bought it hook, line, and sink. I'm not going to lie to anybody and tell you that was my glue. That was my therapist. That whole album, National Acrobat, and that were keeping me together. And all of a sudden, when I saw Black Sabbath the first time, they were terrible. Ozzy was terrible, so I didn't know what to think. I left there like I lost face. Like That was Never Say Die Tour. Never Say yeah, Die. Like, yeah. That's like wearing a jersey to watch your team, and he sucks. And you got to walk home with that fucking jersey on in front of everybody. And everybody on the bus was talking about that guitar play. In the first band, and, and you're like, God damn it! And then he disappeared for a while. Nobody knew what was happening. Ozzy got thrown out of the band. Nobody knew. And then we found out they got they had a singer, which I always play. That was horrible. The first singer after Ozzy. Oh yeah, Dave Walker. Oh, just god awful. Yeah, he was god awful. Yeah, it sounded was... like diarrhea. <laughs> yeah, and then. They said something about Dio from whatever, and I remember buying Rainbow Rising and listening to it and going, I don't think this is going to work. Like, this ain't going to work. This is not going to work. This Dio Ozzy collaboration, this Dio Sabs collaboration is not going to fucking work. And then the album came out, and it was. It's like, it's like eating asshole. It's not kosher. But you do it anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like right. If a chick told you, eat my <laughs> asshole, and I'll suck your dick, you tell her, bend over, I'll eat that fucking thing. Without Even if I find the peanut, whatever I find, I'm in. <laughs> even it's, even it's, if you don't suck my dick, I'll yeah, do it. It's, uh, <laughs> it was something peanut. that you wanted to hate. <laughs> like, I wanted to hate heaven and hell. Absolutely. With all my heart. But it just every time you listen to it, today, I went to cryotherapy. When I came in, I right. went to freeze, and today the guy goes, what do you want to hear? And I go, heaven and hell. And he goes, yeah, I haven't played that in a while because I got into a Madonna kick. Right. So I go in there and throw punches because at least in Madonna you could dance around. But having it hell, just having it hell, I go in there and throw kicks, twists. I'm doing black flips in the fucking air. Yeah, I love that whole. Now, today, when I left Dio, I was pissed. That drive from Philly back to North Bergen was a fucking long drive. We were like the my future is their fans. <laughs> yeah, because he lie. wasn't singing the songs right. No. He wasn't. And we're mad. Like, come on, sing it like Ozzy if you're going to do it. But he was, he couldn't. He, he was trying to do his interpretation. I'll never forget that when he came. He's like, generals gathered in their masses. Yeah. Just like witches at black masses. And we're like, oh, no. How does Ozzy do it? You know, like fucking a savage. Like John Osborne would do it. Yelling and screaming and fucking clapping and shit hanging off him. And, you know, come on, let's go, you fucking measly bastards. Put your hands together. Yeah, are you high? So am yeah. I. Smoke those joints. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was yelling and shit, getting yeah. you going. And it was, you know, I still remember having Live at Last. Remember when you bought the bootleg? Live at Last. They had that. We talk about it all the time. East, West. And, uh, and uh, by the way, by the fucking way, this happened, just so you know. I saw an ad for you coming to San Diego or whatever the fuck on Twitter last Saturday. It was a general thing on somebody else's feed or your feed. Right. And when I went, I go, that's interesting. Jim's coming to town. And when I flipped over to my feed, guess what was in the picture? A picture of the building across the street from Hudson County Park. The tall building with the grinder where they saw the Martians from. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, the, and they go, show Jimmy Florentine this picture. And I go, let me call this motherfucker. He's coming on the podcast this <laughs> week. That's what happened. That's how, That was Saturday. Saturday or Friday. I was on yeah. the road last week. Yeah. That's how weird it was. That one minute you were saying you were doing a show, and on my other thread, it was a guy that stopped at the light and took a picture of that building. Wow. And said, the ghost building where you and Jimmy Florentine talked about over here. No, that Black Sabbath thing was something that today, if we ever go to therapy, it'll come up. 
Like eventually after a year, they'll say, so what happened early on in your youth? Well, I caught my mother sucking a dick, but when Ozzy left Sabbath, it was, it was just tra traumatizing. It was devastating, yeah. I mean, <coughs> devastating. Speaking of, like when the Die of a Madman, the record came out, I'd have to listen to that song, Die of a Madman, before I go to school in 11th grade. I hated it, I was a bad place in my life. We just moved, I had no friends. I was in a private Catholic school in Florida, didn't know anyone, all the kids were rich. I had long hair. They drive around in Mercedes. I had a shitty beat up Volkswagen with Black Sabbath bumper stickers and Judas Priest. And no, I had no friends. And I would listen to that song every day to get me through it before I went to school. That fucking song is unbelievable. The, the, the song Die of a Man, man, it's fucking. Oh. The guitar on Holy that when he shit. picks up the second verse oh. on it, like it opens up slowly with like oh. piano or something, a harp. And then he comes down, 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 down. down. Now, 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 now. Now, here's the weird thing about that. I guess his mother taught in Burbank. Yeah. His mother taught guitar in Burbank till just recently, maybe 10 years ago. I don't know. Somebody who came in here and was talking about guitar lessons. Scott Quinn, Ed Quinn, because Ed Quinn studied with Joe Satriani. So he said, yeah, Randy Rose was right down the corner. Man. Can you imagine that? Like that kid, and he taught guitar lessons. And then he joined Cry Riot, and I saw the album yesterday. I almost got it. Which I have it here. The qual the mental health. Oh, okay, yeah, That's yeah. Not, he's gone by then. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. He was. But I, I wanted to buy the album. What's the one he's on? He's on um, what the one before with Slick Black Cadillac. Slick Black Cadillac, and yeah, um, I forget what it was. It was not the one a before. big one. No, it wasn't. They weren't. It, and was, it was big so, in Japan. It was so crazy that the one I have is one of the number one. Selling albums of all time. That was the first heavy metal record to hit the number one on the Billboard charts. Is Quiet Riot Metal Quiet Health. Right, that's what it is. Yeah, first album ever, heavy and, metal. Record. And I got to tell you something between you and I as friends, and you know I love Rudy. It drives me crazy sometimes. Whenever I hear it on any song, bang your head, metal, it drives me crazy. Like I'm like, why am I listening to this? Right. This is too much for me. So you guys are uh, to me like I think there's a difference between like a fan. I don't think you guys are fans. You sound like experts almost to me. Or you, it sounds like you were more than fans. Well, you had to know your stuff. Like, you know, if you were going to go and you had to challenge somebody, you better know. You, you better, better be able to back it up. You better fucking know. Yeah. Like, if you're going to get into arguments, like, I, there's, a, there's a bunch of shows I went to see. Like, I get people still bust my balls. Like, you were wrong on that date, but you were close. You know, at least I'm in the neighborhood. I still remember going, what was the place that, I saw Missing Persons there. Oh, I love that band. I saw them there in 81, maybe, 82, 83, whatever the big album was popular. What was the big album with Walking in L.A.? Yeah, that Spring was Session M. Spring Session M, yeah. Spring Session M. I saw a Noticeable one. Oh, a my song. God. Holy that opens shit. up the fucking one. That opens it up. And I've had Raiden on, who's uh, Terry's son. Oh, he did? Okay. The drummer's son. He also plays the drums. Great kid. He's on Facebook. We talk from time to time. But guess who I went to see there one night on an invite? And I'm embarrassed. It's like, you know what I'm really embarrassed about? Two things, and I'll let you go. I know you got to get on to San Diego. One, I didn't really like Lemmy when they opened for. Uh, for Ozzy? Blizzard. Like, really? I, I'm like, what is this? What is this fucking junk? <laughs> this is junk. This is junk. Like, well, because it was super... I didn't even understand. Super loud, right? And just fucking 100 miles an hour. And you're like, what? Yeah, I, I could see Now it. I like it. Now I, can... now, 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 now I like Lemmy. And I understand what he stood for and the whole fucking deal. In fact, uh, he does a show. Uh, Eddie Trunk is doing on the residency. At the at the rainbow at the rainbow yeah I'm gonna try to go up there and see him live when he comes back I thought it was every Friday in fucking August I was misinformed I was gonna try to go tonight oh, okay Friday. yeah no I think he does it once a month yeah, yeah I was gonna take my wife and watch Eddie Trunk she's like what are you what are you talking Eddie Trunk I'm not gonna see Eddie Trunk I'm like nobody else likes Eddie Trunk I'm gonna go watch him live and ask him some creepy fucking questions. You know what I'm <laughs> Where are you? So tonight you're in San Diego. Tonight, San Diego. Uh, then I got Atlantic City, the new hard, the hard Rock Casino open in Atlantic City. How is it? I haven't been there yet, but I'm doing uh, three nights there. Howie Mandel, I guess, owns the club. It's the Howie Mandel Comedy Club. 
So August 28th through the 30th, me and Don Jameson are there. And then I'm doing uh, the Funny Bone in Albany, September 13th through 15th. How's my man Don doing? He's doing great. He's uh, on tour with Faster Pussycat. Jesus Christ. He's up for three months on the tour bus. He does 20 minutes of stand-up, and he brings up the band. He's such a fucking He's savage. an animal. He's a sa- yeah, he is. He's on the tour bus with those guys. They fucking just rage and drink like they're 20 years old. He's on it for three months. And he plays these rock clubs or wherever they are to get like eight, uh, you know, anywhere between like 300 to 1,000 a night. And he does, you know, in the crowd, and he does 20 minutes of stand up in front of those animals. And then he brings on the band. I just want to tell you the only guys that listen on my serious listen to Lithium, you, Jim, and what's his name? And I love your shows. I love when you tell stories. The, the, the one that you got me was with the cherry bomb, and I sat there. I guess because I didn't hear from you for years, and you got a message to me. He goes, dude, I was at that show. <laughs> my God. Oh, my shit. God. I, I cried. My wife got in the car. She's like, what are you crying about now? Because <laughs> I always cry. I'm like, I'm crying because fucking people can validate my fucking stories. I remember that fucking cherry bomb. I also remember when the Good Rats opened up for the, uh, Aerosmith at the garden, and somebody threw a cherry bomb. I, I Joe. Perry, and he fucking got off stage. I remember a lot of shit. Number last thing I want to ask you is, how much do people torture you about that metal show? Oh, it's... Jesus Christ. It's insane. Like People really... And I miss it kind of a way. Because right. I'd no. watch it if I wasn't doing it. And it was a great guest. I'd watch it. Yeah, well, you know, look, we were on... We did 140 episodes. We were on for eight, seven, eight years. You know, a TV, a TV time. That's amazing to be on that long. And eventually, you know, show runs its course. But meanwhile, you know, it was Viacom, the company that was VH1 Classic, only would just shit the bed, you know, so they had to come in and make some major cuts. And pretty much most of the original programming got cut, including our show. And they just said goodbye. We got to, you know, we're losing a fucking ton of money in this company that owns MTV, all that other shit. So it was more of a corporate decision. But people still come up. Look, me, Don, and Eddie were the three hosts of the show, a heavy metal talk show. We have no say in the matter, like where it goes. You can't just go up to an actor. You know, do you think people go up to Jennifer Aniston, like, you should get friends on Netflix? <laughs> you know, where they going up to Galdafini after Sopranos, going, well, what, you ever try Showtime? How about Hulu? Yeah, what about Hulu? Just a new, you know, well, just do, why don't you guys put it on YouTube? Do Sopranos for YouTube. You know what I mean? It's like, you have, there's so many other people that control that. Like, we don't own the show. We just can't go, hey, my friend works at HBO. He wants the show. You know, so there's all this, you know, red tape. Once in a while, shows do come back. Absolutely. I mean, it's a niche audience. You know, we're interviewing Lita Ford. You know, we're not going to go on after UFC fighting on, on um, you know, on Spike or something like that or USA Network because it's a whole different audience. So if we find a channel, I don't know, at some point, but who knows? I mean, someone who have to get, acquire the rights from VH1, who owns the show, and have to pay them for VH1 to give them the rights and then they can put it on their network. It, remember Howard Stern did those old Channel 9 shows right. back in the day. They were fucking classic. They were incredible. Channel 9 owns that stuff, owns those shows. They never gave them back to Howard Stern wanted to buy them to put them out on DVD. They would never let They go, nope. I, he probably offered them millions of dollars and Channel 9 just said, nope, fuck you. You're not getting them. And he never, he could never release them because they own them. So VH1 basically owns the show, Viacom. So if at some point some network is interested, they're going to have to go to them and go, hey, here's 250000 We have the show and all the back catalog. That's how it would work if it ever came back. I would, would Look, we'd love it, but you know, at this point, there's nothing you could do. I'm not Who gonna... was the coolest guy you met on this show? I mean, we had, we had Iomi everybody, on. Everybody. Iomi. Everybody. Everybody. Fucking Bill Ward. Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. We had we had Angus and Brian. We had Angus and Brian Johnson on when the, the Black Ice album came out, like in two thousand eight, our first season. We interviewed those guys. I mean, that's fu- it, insane. Insane. Who was playing the guitar in the back? It, like you had. We had different guys. Well, Ted Nugent. We had Ted Nugent on. I always say he was probably my favorite guest because I never met him. In seventy six, with the you know, uh, um, what was the the concert that uh, shit. When he's outside, the, uh, the California Jam. The California Jam. Yeah, he's out there with the fucking rabbit tail, and he's got no shirt on, and his fucking hair's all over the place, and he's singing Cat Scratch Fever and Motor City Madhouse. I was a, I was addicted at 12 years old. I'm like, this is fucking holy shit. So I, and I, then he comes on that metal show, and he was, did, you know, no, didn't talk politics or any guns or any of that shit. Just a funny dude talking about music, and then went up there and jammed for like the last 10 minutes of the show. Just fucking took his guitar and just jammed. It was funny because VH1. We weren't allowed to play any original music because then they have to pay rights for it. They have to pay royalties on it. They're too cheap. They didn't want to pay any. So 
if anyone that came out, we couldn't play any of their songs. Any of the guitar players couldn't play any of their licks to their songs because then they would have to pay a royalty to that band. They go, we're not doing that. Ted comes on. He goes, look, I want to play my songs. And they go, you can't. He goes, I own all my music. They go, uh, you still can't. He goes, no, I'm, I own it. I, I say it's okay. You can play. And they go, no. We go, we go, look, I'll sign it. Give me a fucking piece of paper. I want to play some of my riffs. And they still wouldn't let him do it. But anyway, we went up there and jammed for fucking 20 minutes. And I'm watching Nugent just, you know, 10 feet away, just rip it on that guitar. It's phenomenal. And then Kirk Hammett came on with Michael Shanker. He's oh. a huge- I knew Michael Shanker had been on that. Michael Shanker, uh, Kirk Hammer from Metallica is a huge Michael Shanker fan. So we're going to have Michael Shanker on. He's going to play guitar. So Eddie calls up Kirk Hammett, Eddie Trunk, because he knows Kirk. He goes, hey, Kirk, I'm going to have Michael Shanker come on. If you guys want to jam together, Kirk's like, what? You, I could jam with, with, with Michael Shanker? He's like, yeah. So Kirk goes, I'll, I'll come there for free, whatever. And he flew to New York. And they fucking jammed. I saw the video. Yeah. You told me about the video. Yeah, so because he was such a big Michael Shanker fan. He was geeking out, and we had them together, and they both played. They they worked something out before the show and just fucking and played on the show. So that was amazing, too. Bro, always a pleasure to have you. Absolutely, Uh, dude. You're one of my favorites, man, without a doubt. Uh, the music, the legend, just taking me back, and uh, you're always welcome. You know how many people come up to me on my comedy shows? Go, dude, I heard you on Joey's podcast. You're fucking great. Yeah, we had. A great I go, time. you two guys. It's fucking. Um, it goes. I don't. I, you know, you tell these stories like there's no way it's true. He goes, but but we know they are. When you first hear them, like there's no way that happened. Oh, this is. It. This, this is why is when it. I heard the cherry bomb, I'm like nobody else remembers <laughs> this shit. I'm gonna be in Huntsville at Levity Live next Thursday night. And then uh, Friday and Saturday, I am in uh, motherfucking Nashville at Zany's. Where are you at, brother? Uh, yeah, I got uh, Atlantic City next week. Okay. August 28th. Through at the, the Hard Rock. Hard Rock, yeah, yeah. Hard and Rock then Atlantic I got City. Albany. I got Cuyahoga Falls in Ohio. Um, I got some Florida dates. I'm doing Miami, uh, Boca. So JimFlorentine.com. My book, Everybody is Awful Except You, is in stores, and it's on Amazon. I love you guys. Have a great weekend. Stay black. And don't forget... If you need some supplements, always go to onit.com. From Alpha Brain, Shroom Tech, Shroom Tech Sports, Shroom Tech Immune. Listen, I got you covered. I fly every two weeks. You don't see me fucking coughing. Number one, I eat ass. Number two, I swam in the Hudson. <laughs> and number three, I eat uh, uh, Shroom Tech Immune. I don't have to walk around like a little Japanese guy with a fucking mask on my face at the fucking airport. So go to fucking onit.com and press in. Church. Bam, and get 10% off. Also, my family. My Gee family over at Fujisports.com, I love you motherfuckers with all my heart. Whether it's the rash guards, the, the fucking shin guards, knee pads, whatever you need, Fuji's got at a great price. From the low end uh, Gee's to $80, to the Superitos to 120 to the Psycho 2.0, we got you covered. Go to Fujisports.com right now and press in. Church. Bam! and get 10% off delivered to your crib. We'll see you motherfuckers next week. Have a great weekend. Jim Florentine, thank you again for coming on. JimFlorentine.com. Yeah, and then uh, my podcast, Comedy Mental Midges, out every week, too. Yeah, no, thanks, man. And I'm a big fan of what he does. Love you, Jim. Thank you very much. Flying Jew, don't kill no fucking Christians this week. Stay black. Kick this fucking mule, Lee.